it's it's almost the end of April 2008 and there's another April with another L here Dennis how are you good I I think of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales did you ever learn the prologue oh yes when that April with the short or so to the truth the and that may be where the name right. came from too because it's French isn't it wonderful? It's French, yeah. Either that or when they came over to Rikers Island on the boat, they, oh. couldn't, spell, they couldn't spell whatever their name was. So what do you want? Spring of April. What another month is it? L April? in it? Let's really yeah. screw them up, right? <laughs> How are you, Dennis? Good. Very good. We're, we're up in the boondocks in the middle of the God's wonderful nature up here in a place where you just feel terrific, don't you? Oh, yeah. I feel very comfortable here. Matter of fact, that's close to home for me. Isn't it great? You know, Dennis, the last time we talked to you, we weren't in among the trees and the trout. We were still being proof for beer when the last time we talked. Isn't that amazing? That's a long, long time ago, we sat around the table at, at, at the, the college. Special collections, and uh, I think we're in a little bit better element to talk outdoors, don't you? I love it. For those people who are may not be from this area, and we pick up new viewers every single week who just love to turn on our little corner so they can learn about the North Country. We want people to know the, the, your old friends and your new friends that Dennis has been around for a while. We don't get we, carded yeah, we don't, anymore. We don't, we, we don't. <laughs> That's not true. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hannaford, about three or four years ago, I thanked the girl very much. I said, I have a daughter about your age, but they really appreciate it. One, one, of the girl, one of the girls in a store the other day says, can I see your ID? And I said, I'll kiss you on both cheeks. Yeah. <laughs> and she laughed. But we take it as a compliment now, we right, do, Gordy? We take it as a high compliment. <laughs> in any case, Dennis has been around here talking about the outdoors, writing about the outdoors, teaching in college, winning prestigious awards, and doing what he likes to do best. And what better in life is there to do than doing something you have a passion for? Well, that's... that's I'm so, I feel so very lucky because I really do enjoy, as you can tell, like this is my kind of territory here. And uh, I feel very comfortable here and stuff. And I feel good about writing about it. And so it's not like coming out of a condo, going out to a mountain, climbing it, and then writing an article about it. I, I hike every day, every day that I can, put in five miles a day. And I don't hike on the roads. I hike back in the woods and stuff. And uh, no, I really, uh, to me, this is, uh, there's, I just like doing it, and I'm, I feel very fortunate. Some people, they you know, they squander away trying to do things just to make money and stuff. And uh, I've been doing this since 1990 with the Press Republican, surprisingly. Well, I know you have 18 years. He lords it over me because he's no. He knows I've written 570 columns, and I've written over 900. I've never <laughs> missed. I've never missed a week, and you yeah. haven't either, right? No, of course. Never not. missed a week. Um, yeah, and you know it's really amazing when we started. When I started doing this, the amazing thing was that. I said, what am I going to write about from week to week? And it's kind of like getting started. In, I used to run track. And uh, when you're out of shape, you're out of shape. But when you get in shape, and after a couple of years, I started getting into the rhythm of things. And I think it's the best thing I've done. I used to do magazines before this. We have like a lead time of months, sometimes a year. Here, every week, you have to have it in. And uh, so you develop a pattern like you have. So on a rhythm and seasonal rhythm and, and whatever the activities are. And... Uh, you know, I like staying in that pattern. I think it's how my magazine stuff, too, because if I have to crank out something very fast, I can do it now, where if I hadn't been doing this for all these years, I don't know if you, do you feel the same way? It's, it's not that difficult for me, because I'm a lot older than you are, so my life experiences are myriad. Uh, yeah. We, uh, we met many things, of course, that will never be mentioned in my column. <laughs> but, you know, meeting people, doing this show, uh, traveling to the other quadrants of this fabulous North Country we live in give me fodder and I know it does to you too. I mean just look at the day we've chosen in late April. Uh, God knows how many times this show will air and in what year even. <laughs> but in 2008 this spring has been uh, legendary thank, almost. Thank God because oh, it was fabulous. a tough tough winter out you know, in this worst. whole area here One of the and uh there's still snow around uh we're only a couple days away from may uh it's it's it was a it's been a very tough winter so these last week or two has been a real pleasure to get rid of that snow and the thing is we don't have the bugs yet 
it's actually the perfect time to come out here because another couple weeks the black flies will be out and a couple weeks ago we'd be dealing with snowflakes we talked about doing this show again a long time ago and yeah. i was reading the exchange of email that you and calvin did <laughs> and the topic of conversation was the weather and the black flies that was and... calvin calvin that's all he cared about no black flies <laughs> uh, and we have done programs where the black flies were you yeah. know just they land on in, in places lines. where they shouldn't be. But yeah, here yeah. we are, this beautiful day in the oh, spring yeah. of 2008, no and this is what sky. it's all about. I mean, it is. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, there's and, and there's so many topics to write about in the outdoors too. I mean, we we do hunting and fishing, but we also get involved with other things like hiking, canoeing, and birding. And uh, so there's really been a lot of good things. I, we run a something called the Wildlife Photo Gallery with the viewers sending photos absolutely and the response has been terrific i mean i had eagle photos we did a spectrum piece uh the paper needed somebody to fill in for uh, a spectrum piece a couple weeks ago so i contacted the photographers who had sent the photos in and they were happy to do it uh to let them go and boy you know and it turned out we got a tremendous response oh yes and and, and uh but then once again it couldn't have happened without the people sending them in to me and, and another really great thing that I really am very happy with, when I first started this outdoors page in 1990, I looked at my first column. We can get it on that library now, that Clinton Essex Franklin oh, yeah. County Library yeah. thing. And, I, and the title was Why an Outdoors Page. And I went through all the reasons why, and I looked back at that because I printed it out, and I said, well, yeah, we've pretty much accomplished it. One of the things I really wanted to do was get women involved with the outdoors page. I didn't want it to be like a good old boy, just that's it, hunting and fishing and stuff. I felt as though it's, they're half the population, and, 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 I want, and women do hunt too. We've run photos of women with deer, oh, with sure. bear and stuff, big fish. I mean, there's, and, and so I'd say maybe almost two-thirds of my emails that I get now are from women. And that's, I'm very happy. And they send in a lot of photos. And, and for people who may not be into, in the fall, a dead deer, if we, there's, there's, there's a bird next to it an interesting bird people have blinders and so we've i just I'm, I'm very happy with the way that's gone it's wonderful and you know just as you were speaking i was thinking how many people read that column look at the pictures and talk to their family about the outer doors every week who would never have the opportunity who move here from the city <laughs> and have no idea that this is well, Calvin and I talk about it on this program, and even riding here in the car, how fortunate we are to live in this oh, yeah. part of the country. Oh, yeah. We think it's one of the finest in the world. Well, and, and um, you know, when you talk about the pictures, I'm convinced of the fact that some people just look at the pictures. They may not even read the articles. And uh, that's okay, too. I mean, if, if the people will take a look, and, and uh, we do rely on photos quite a bit. We turned to color in 97. Um, Jim Dinko said, well, we want to put you in color. We'll put you on the back page. I said, okay, because I had a lot of photos, and I, I mean, I take a lot of photos out here. Maybe later I'll show you a trail camera before I get a number of my wildlife prints. Um, and um, so that was one step in the right direction because color looks so terrific with the, oh, with the photos. Oh, yeah. I mean, we were in black and white. It was nice. Black and white's a great medium and stuff, but it can't match the color. And then, of course, the next big jump for us was going on the internet that was 2001 and i was the last holdout you may be the last holdout for all i know but uh i felt as though it's gonna be a lot more work and it's just i don't really want to do it. and they convinced me to do it and we've gotten a lot of good feedback off the internet Isn't it? it's amazing <laughs> it's just another dimension entirely it is and I, don't, I never got into the blogging thing myself no. No. foxy does a fun blog for for the <laughs> press republican and it feels it fills a need. I never got into blogging. I'm just doing other things. No, I'm not going to do a blog either. Uh, and, and I see the point. The, in, in order to do a good blog, you really got to stay on top of it. It's time consuming. I have a full time job too uh, at the college. So it's, it's and, and plus the fact that I put my opinion out of my columns enough that, you know, you, if, if somebody has a problem with it, they can take it right there. But I don't want to put it on the internet too. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's, that's exactly the way I feel about yeah. it. I, I yeah. do a lot of emails to my friends around the country so they know what I'm doing and, and they can, they can read our stuff on the internet and they know what we're doing. Right. And uh, no, it's, uh, it's definitely a different experience. I, you've seen a, a lot of changes since 1990. I think that 
a lot of the local papers now are trying to come up with outdoor pages, you know, maybe you to compete. That, huh? uh, well, I've been, I, we get them we, because they're free. They come yeah. in the mail. I mean, so I, yeah, you scan through them and that. And uh, it's, so, uh, it's flattering to know that they that, that right. something they know has worked. It's a formula that yeah. works, and they try to emulate it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that the main thing is variety and um I, I just you got to live out in, in in the woods and you got to really be active in it because to see things you can read stuff and you can but but to actually to see it firsthand and and I do see a lot of stuff and uh, so I can report it if somebody says well you're it's a lot of nonsense I say well I where do you live I live right here yeah I live there I live it every day of my yeah. life I walk in the woods. Uh, yep. You know, I don't live in the city and make believe. No, and, and you had did. Where were you born and brought up? I asked you this I'm a not long gonna, time ago. And you know, I'm not going to answer you anyway, so that's oh. okay. <laughs> so that uh, okay. Next question. <laughs> so, uh, did you have an early passion? Oh yes, yeah. I will say that when I was 11 years old, my parents sent me up to uh, Ontario, Northern Ontario, on a YMCA trip, and I liked it so much that. I talked the outfitter, his name was Mike Bates, into allowing me to, it was a roadless area, 73 miles from nearest road, north of Sudbury, Ontario. So my parents agreed to it. I might have been a little bit older, maybe I was 13. And um, I started up there working as a um, cabin boy and worked my way up as a guide, guided bear hunters and uh, fishermen and stuff. And I just loved it. And I had no electricity. I You were pretty young then. I was very, very young then, yeah. I was under, uh, I think the last year I actually did, I was like, 16 let a couple years go by because I got involved with sports in high school and then went back to it while I was college you know to make money during the summers and that but uh, no electricity we used to get the water with a pail from a spring and um, you know I, I just I, I enjoyed it very much I, I like my privacy which is why we're not saying too much here today and um, you know and, and my wife is the same way I know you're you're more open Roger. does she uh, does she share your passion for the outdoors Do yes you hike together sometimes not as much as we used to um, she she's got a full-time job she teaches up in Beekman town music and so it's she has a lot to do I mean when you're a vocal teacher and so on we're playing the piano for singers and that so it's tough time wise but she when walks as much as she can yeah yeah my daughter was the one who who came with me a lot really Carolyn yeah I started her when she was about three. My son came with me for a while, and then he got involved in high school sports and other things, and so which is good because I like sports too, and football and and and, and baseball and stuff like that. So I followed him. I I used to throw him passes, and I'd wet the football so that he could he would have to he was a receiver have to catch the ball when it was wet and stuff, and and uh, I really enjoyed doing that. Whereas my daughter, we did more of the outdoor stuff. I've taken her up to northern Quebec fishing with me when she no was kidding. 10. Oh, oh, yeah. She loved it? Oh, yeah. Very competitive, Isn't too. If counting the number of fish each one of us caught, no I had to make sure she caught the most. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> <Boy>. <laughs> That's wonderful. She's in college now. She's a student at SUNY Potsdam. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. That's great. Majoring in what? Does she... Music. <laughs> Music, of course. Yeah. yeah. But you know what? When you take your kids on walks like that, which we did often when, with all of our huge, huge number of kids. We would take walks in the woods, and uh, because we didn't have money to go on expensive vacations like modern families might do, so was Ma and Pa Kettle go, you know, to Whiteface or wherever we happen to go on a given weekend. And my kids don't ever forget that. They all love to be in the woods now. Yep. They love to camp. They love to fit, fish and hunt. So... I, I, once you do that, even though they develop different interests, that's part of their fabric, and I think it bodes well for... Yeah, and, and my daughter in particular, because she had the music, the cultural part from my wife, and uh, I, I, take, I take her a lot. I, she's been in the paper a lot, too. And uh, she ever, I've got pictures of her when she's a little thing up there on Panther Mountain and stuff, a little pack and stuff. And she still comes with me now. Every, every uh, May we go over to New Hampshire. I photograph moose and fish, and she's, she's my partner. And actually now helps with the driving, which is really nice, because I, I the driving anymore. It's just, you know, I get tired. So uh, it's, a good, it's a good thing. You know, we, we've stayed together. They always told me when she was going to be a teenager, she won't want any party again. You know, she'll just ignore you and stuff. And she never got, she never did that. Never went through that? No, no, never, never, like, disowned her father or anything. My son... 
walk 10 feet in front of me to <laughs> know who I was. Yeah. But, uh, but my daughter, now she, she never really, uh, I mean, she's getting a little independent now and stuff, but, uh, as far as anything, she's 20 years old, but, um, she always, she always, if I say to her, Carolyn, let's go up to, uh, Alaska. She'd be right unpacked and ready to go the next day. Isn't it great? And we, oh, yeah. Uh, Kay and I, <clears throat> my wife's name is Kay, as our audience knows, talked last night on the phone with our, one of our granddaughters, Sarah. And she and her fiancé just got back from South America and Peru, and they did the four-day hike up to Machu Picchu on the top. Wow. And they got up there, and, and uh, Ryan said, now, if everybody just be still for a moment. And they said, okay, what's this all about? He handed one of the guys his camera, and he got down on one knee and proposed to oh my uh, god that's neat in the, you in, hear the, about that. in the ruins up there and so of course we're giggling and laughing and so on but they love the out of doors i've got video of my daughter when she was three walking around and i'm pointing out trees to her this is a white birch and then she she was really fast at picking it up so i take her again and, and she'd be falling all over the place i don't even know if she had, my daughter took a little longer to get potty trained than my son and uh she might have been banging or falling down. You can't down hold that against her when no. she's 20, Dennis. <laughs> no, you know. I know that. She'll love to hear that. She'll <laughs> to say, too. Uh, turn red immediately. Yeah. But, uh, but, but she picked up the trees and stuff, started learning those. And uh, so she has a, a very, very good knowledge of the outdoors. And she was never squeamish when I clean a partridge, fish. I don't think she's ever been around when I've done a deer. But um, she, no problem at all. I, th I don't know if my son would really want to do that. But uh, be around there. But she she was very very interested. And I don't know how interested she is now. Of course she's a little bit older, but uh, she never had a problem with that. But that was, that's part of your legacy. Yeah. Not 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 just with your own kids, but that's a good place to start. But with all these other people who are now nurturing their kids with the outdoors because of the words you've written and the pictures well, you've taken. Well, it'd be nice to the nice to think of that. Said and so on. Now, um, did you go to college right out of high school? Yes. Yes, I did. I um, I went to school, college in the South, and I did because I was involved with running and track. Yeah. I went to the University of Tennessee. I lasted the running part of it about a year and a half. Got into some habits, you know, and uh, like we all do in college. And uh, and, and I wasn't into it. I mean, you you really had to be dedicated yeah. on that level. You had to be really just ready to work out constantly because they're all good, as good or if not better than you are. So that, but I liked the, I stayed down there because I liked the climate and I, li I liked the Smoky Mountains and I had friends down there. I should have worn my Smoky Mountain hat. Wait, I took it out, off the shelf to wear this morning. I had my great Smoky Mountain hat to wear here today and forgot. At least I wore my outdoor Well, shirt. you're a man of many hats. Uh, uh, anyway. Yeah, sure. yeah, sure. But, uh, anyway. Yeah, no, and, and um, so I, I stayed there and, and uh, I got my bachelor's degree down there and uh, it was a good experience. I don't know if I could go back now though. It's a different, it takes a while to get into that lifestyle. And, and uh, you know, I, I student taught in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Did you? And I talk really fast, as probably anybody who's listening to this can tell. Well, and I'm in I'm in a classroom and they're looking at me. <laughs> What y'all saying? And uh, I had to slow down, really, really. And it was like a ninth grade class and stuff. And uh, but it was uh, it was a good experience. And I've taught up at the, then when I here I'm in this area here, I've taught up in the prison and yes, places like that. Yes, you told me that. That's that a lot. I know a lot of people who've done that and have gone on to teach at one of the community colleges here in the North Country. And then how did you get involved with Plattsburgh State? Well, I had been I I got my master's at Plattsburgh State. Yeah. And then uh, I was applied for adjunct position in 1980 and then um, that wasn't enough to make any to survive so Clinton Community College had an IHEP program at the prison and uh, so for the associate's degrees so this was before I think uh, Pataki got rid of that in 92 or something but throughout the 80s I would go up there nights and teach writing literature classes yeah. and so on and um, it was right at the beginning of the AIDS stuff and well that was quite an experience because i remember one summer teaching a class up there and there's a mosquito flying around and i see this guy in the back wiping his hands i'm saying i said to him what the hell are you doing he says i don't want to get aids and i looked at him i, I said, said is... I, I looked at him i said kill that mosquito kill that mosquito <laughs> why am nobody, i laughing nobody it's, it's nobody so sad, nobody it? well nobody knew anything yeah. about it back then yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, and, and that was one of the places where we were getting our share of, uh, I guess, AIDS cases. Yeah. But, um, 
Oh boy. It was a good experience, though. I, I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed teaching up there to some extent. It was going up there. It was kind of a, on a February night with the wind howling and you know, and dark and three hours. And some nights we stayed longer. It was a dark and stormy night. Yeah. It was like a, it was it was exactly there were nights you go in there and it was like a gothic. Yeah, sure. Like like the alien. Oh, yeah. You see these people just looking there, waiting to come out because they march them across to the school sure. and stuff. And uh, it was it was a good experience, I think. So it's amazing the, the, the chapters of our life experience and how they play out and how they affect who we are now. And there was such it? a contrast to the students I had at Plattsburgh State. The inmates were like really, really good with details, but they were terrible grammatically. Like Plattsburgh State students are really good grammatically, but they didn't have a lot, 18 years old, you know, they didn't have a lot to write about. These guys, most of them are from downstate, you know, in the, in the city. I mean, they had some incredible experiences. Many of them had GEDs. So that was really quite an quite an experience. Probably no probably no field trips though, right? Uh, no, 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 no football teams either. <laughs> yeah, well, I've seen some of the football matches out in the yard up there in Clinton in the olden days. Wow, I don't know if they do that anymore, but they used to welcome other local teams coming in there, and there were the troopers. I think oh, would yeah, come in sure. and something with a team, and that I saw a picture they had hanging up there of their of their their team, Clinton oh, yeah, Correctional yeah. Facility team, and underneath this, these guys are really killers. <laughs> Oh gosh! Oh gosh! <laughs> no, I'm serious. That was the whoever wrote the caption. That's what the yeah. person put. So you, so you joined the uh, English department at Plattsburgh State. I was, I was in the English department, yes. And then uh, when English and journalism split, I kind of went full time in journalism. I swung over to journalism, and uh, that's where I'm at now. But you've been, you were you a good writer in high school? Um, I don't think so. I really don't think so. I was in I was in honors classes and we never learned how to write. We were just told do book reviews and do all this Isn't other that stuff. Interesting. And 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 uh, it was we were supposed to be smart enough to not to have to do this. So I never I, I went to a Catholic elementary school, but I did learn sentence diagramming and grammar. Yeah. But I got into high school and I mean we didn't. I just so I decided when I taught I'm not going to uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure they know the basics. And. 20 years ago is a lot different from today because it's much more difficult today with text messaging, the internet, the very, very poor, poor habits that young people pick up because just with text messaging alone, to try to say, well, look, you got to write in a complete sentence. It, 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 now think about that for those senior citizens, and we do have quite a few who watch this program. It's, uh, I've talked to a lot of college professors who are trying to teach journalism in English and creative writing classes, <clears throat> and they're getting, they're getting so much of this new nomenclature into the papers that the kids are writing, they, they don't know how to handle it. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it really is a challenge, I think. Uh, <laughs> Very interesting. But, you know, you see it in newspaper writing, too, in, in, in public. We're talking yeah. about people who are staff writers and stuff, trying to mimic television so you don't have a, you can have these little fragments and stuff and actually complete paragraphs that are not sentences and that, I guess, for effect. And I tell my students, I mean, if you can say it in a complete sentence, why do the other? You know, I'm just... I really, I, I, I'm very careful because I teach upper division classes at Plattsburgh State. I don't want to be going out writing something horrible. You know, I, I'm pretty sure that the dean and, and the department chair and that read my stuff. So you try to, you try to, you try to, you try to <laughs> yeah. do it correctly. And I would do it any that way anyway because I, I feel as though you got to do it for your own. But, but you've not just written for the Press Republic, and you've written for, you started writing for magazines and other Adirondack, publications. Adirondack and Life and, and, and pub, Country Journal and publications like that. I did a couple of nationals with the Sports Afield, the old Sports Afield when it existed. And uh, it went under and then came back again. But so, I've, yeah, I've done a lot of that. In 80, I published my first article in 82. In the New York State Did Conservationist. You really? 1982? Yeah, and I took a photo of a lightning bolt out of my front door with an old Pentex camera, and it turned out really well. I sent it down to the conservationist. I said, um, Would you be interested in using this photo? And they said, Why don't you work up an article? So I wrote up an article on lightning, and I the photo, and I took another photo of uh, heat lightning to show the differences, and that was my first one. And I got seven copies of the magazine. <laughs> 
and it's a one year subscription. So I sent it to my mother. I love it. My, oh, my every relative it. I had, and they're going, oh, he made he's it. He's got it. He's, he's got. There. I mean, the readers got seven <laughs> copies of the magazine in a year subscription. Oh, in a year isn't, subscription. Isn't that wonderful? But you know, when you start writing like that, you don't you don't even think of how no. much money you're going to be paid. It, it's and and as private a person as you are, and as much as you love the sanctity of the out of doors. You have an element inside your soul which loves to share what you've learned and what you see. And every time somebody looks at a picture you've taken, they're looking through your eyes. Right. And that's not a bad thing. I mentioned the word legacy a while ago. And after you and I are long and gone and turned the, the dust under our feet, people are going to read those articles and look at those pictures and say, that's the man Dennis April was. And that's not a bad thing to be remembered by, you know. No, I'm, I'm, I maybe am not as, I, that, and, I, and I hope that's the case. But I, I feel as though, I've, you know, I've seen people come and go. And if you, five years later, do you remember who, maybe Bird Burdan, oh, a lot of the young people don't remember, yet he was an icon here and so on. Uh, and, and so what I try not to do is, you know, I don't try to, I don't have a really big ego when it comes to this kind of thing, I try to minimize my importance because, because everybody's replaceable. <laughs> Yeah. It may not be exactly the same. But I don't, your view of the out of doors is not replaceable. I don't know what they're going to do when, they, when, you, I, when I go. It's abs what you've done is unique because they're well, I appreciate either it. for good, keep, either keep for good, good or not so good. Going. There is not another Dennis April, and there probably won't be, but that's a good thing. But there's a, a, a there, there'll never be another Noah John Rondo either. No, no there won't be. No, there won't be. You know, yeah. you you are unique in so many ways, but that's because you view. You view these ponds and these trees a little bit differently than I do. We share a love for it, but our passion is a little bit different depending on, on how we got here, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm very comfortable in this environment. I really, I really enjoy it, I, which is why I, I, I go up to northern Canada every, every um, summer up to like the British Columbia and the Yukon and occasionally into Alaska. Because I feel we used to, remember we ran that video I oh, think sure. from uh, six what years a ago. What a great trip! That was with your yeah, daughter. Well, that was with, no, that was I did that alone. Oh. But that was where I caught the big fish oh, there yeah, and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. But anyway, uh, I with the Alaska Highway, you could step back, and if you didn't have those big snow-capped mountains way off in the distance, you look at the media mountains. It could be the Northways, some places, and um, so I feel I feel very much at home there. I don't know and it, anybody listening to this is going to think I'm r ridiculous. I don't know if I can go down to Cancun in February. <laughs> <laughs> nice thought. And do an article. I can go down as a vacation and just have fun. But to have to write an article about something that I am just not familiar with. Wildlife, vegetation, wildlife meaning four-legged wildlife. And uh, I just don't know if I could, um, could do that. But I could go up to Alaska and feel very comfortable writing about it. Because that's kind of like my turf. It's hard to explain. Yeah. This is my turf. If you ask me to do a business article, I tell you, forget it. I, I wouldn't know where to begin. I have no interest in it. Well, you know, I write for two business magazines, and I don't have a great interest either, but I, I just Editors, considered it. Note, take note of that. <laughs> <laughs> just considered it a challenge. Yeah. Uh, and so it takes me twice as long as the average bear, but I don't have to go to the college and teach every day, so I have time to develop the themes, you know? And, 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 but I, I just I don't have an interest. Yeah. personal interest in that kind of thing. There's certain things that I'm really, I think I'm very, very competent in doing, and there's other things that I, I'm, I'm just not. And uh, that would be, that's one area, that's just an example, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, the economy and this other stuff here, politics in Plattsburgh. <laughs> I mean, Politics you know, in the country, we're doing this at the end of yeah. April 2008 in the wildest political time <laughs> in, in, in my history and perhaps in our nation's history it's crazy so uh, it's good that you can come back to, <laughs> you yeah. can come back to the ponds and the, the, and the rocks and the rills it's, it's very very soothing isn't it yeah, just listening oh, to the water flowing here and so wonderful. on um you know and, and some people have to have the the ipods on and the music blasting and so on for me i just i have to wind down Oh, the music of the spheres is all around us and all you you know my my viewers know and all of my friends and family know that I live less than three feet from the edge of the Saranac River in Morrisonville far enough off the road so I can divorce myself from the traffic and just sit on the back enclosed back porch and watch the river or stand out on the river bank when the mosquitoes aren't too bad and just listen to it but subliminally you can hear that sound 
even at night through the walls and it's I think it's I've always considered it uh, a wonderful experience and good for what ails you. you oh know? absolutely absolutely some of the best ideas I get I, like I said I, I try to walk about five miles every day in the woods and um, I have trails on my property and stuff um, and, and I get a lot of ideas where I get clear it clears the brain when when things are hassling you or something it's just kind of it's like soothing and then the exercise and so on combined and, and I, I recommend it to anyone I used to run I used to really was into the, in the early 90s Empire State Games and snowshoe racing summer stuff and that and going out every night and doing my I did actually worked harder probably at that stage of my life than I did when I was in college yeah. and you know trying an aging jock trying to make a little bit of a comeback and then uh, but then you know now I think the walking is much more soothing and beneficial than all that working out stuff now my heart doesn't pound like it used to I go out there and do repetitions of 400 meters I have staked out on the road and I go and I do my three or four I time myself and stuff now you know, I don't even look at the clock. Your heart thanks you for it, too. Yeah. I think. <laughs> well, we it was got, good. It was good exercise. We got so much to talk about, and we're going to cover a lot of topics, and we'll be back with our great show in just a moment. Oh, we've covered a lot of ground, Dennis. As a matter of fact, we found a picnic table, <laughs> and I yeah. love it. We're sitting here. There are a lot of aspects <laughs> of your interesting life yeah. that we haven't talked about, and a lot of it is surrounding your writing. Um, you started writing professionally, what, around 1980? 82 was my first publication. It was uh, in The Conservationist. Yeah. And uh, it was, did we just mention that about the, the lightning photo? Yeah, so I think that's absolutely terrific. But it started know. with a photograph. It started with a photograph. And, so uh, you compared that with the heat lightning. Compared it, well, and, and went through a little thing on lightning and how a cone... Uh, you know how it how it hits and how to protect your house and you know what to do in the woods and so on and and they did a nice layout and uh, although I only got the seven copies and stuff and the year was, subscription and, you know what it was the most thirty two baby chicks and a genuine illustrated <laughs> copy of the right the key was though you had something published so the next year when I went to Adirondack Life I did an article on the moose it was the first article written about the moose come back in in New York and it started in nineteen eighty. <clears throat> Guy Steve Maynard was covering with the Press Republican, did a oh, really sure. great job. And uh, so I, I was very, very much interested in it because when I was a kid up in Canada, that's what we had. We had moose mostly. And I couldn't figure out why the Adirondacks didn't have moose because uh, it looked like any other place. It looked like even uh, Maine and stuff. And uh, we just didn't have them. So when they came back, I was very, very interested. And I followed it. Actually, when I was a college student at Plattsburgh State in 1979, I did a preliminary study of the Vermont moose. And went over there. We brought a moose head back from an illegally shot one. Looked for brain worm at that time. Was supposedly a limiting factor for moose and that. And um, I wasn't even a biology major. I'm doing this stuff. Yeah. And uh, so I, I was really, really interested in it. So anyway, that's where one interest turned into a publication. My first paying article was 1983, Adirondack Life. It was called The Moose Came Back. And um, we used a photo from up in Champlain, uh, the Press Republican Steve had taken, of a of a guy who shot a moose in his backyard he claimed he was being attacked so he had to go in the house get a 30 30 came back and shot it and um, so th and then we had other photos and that and of course since then the moose have really taken off and everybody's become a little bit of a moose expert but um, I, uh, I I've, I've I found it very very interesting we had one out in front of my place at one time did and, you uh, really? oh yeah yeah cow moose and uh, uh, it's really interesting how wildlife and the Adirondacks and everything has changed. I mean, we turkeys all over the place now. And, uh, turkeys? Wild We're doing turkeys. this show in 2008. Have you ever seen so many turkeys in your life? No, but, you know, out in the mountains, they weren't always there. I mean, Chazy, Champlain, up that way, Scioto. But, but to get them in here, I mean, I can remember when I was back in the 90s going up to Scioto, having to get up at three o'clock in the morning because you have to get out there early sure to hunt turkeys now you can get them right in the adirondacks so it's it's quite a change but anyway that that adirondack life article then was the first paying publication i had and then after you get one and two it because it gives you more credibility and i've written a lot of articles for adirondack life i think um in their they have they have um, directories 
from all the publications. And I think I'm in the top five as far as number of publications, number of articles. It's a very special <clears throat> publication anyway. Thank God for Adirondack Life. What a great job they've done over the consistently. Yeah. Yeah, and I started, I don't know how many editors I went through. Uh, Bob Carmen was the editor when I started, and right on through Betsy Falwell and stuff. And, uh, oh, no, they've been always very good with me. And uh, I do a lot of nature and wildlife stuff for them. But I've done other things, too, guitar makers and stuff like that. Yeah, well, with your wife's interest in music, this we were talking before the camera started about Gibson guitars and Martin guitars yep. and having an almost intelligent conversation on the subject. Yes, I love yeah. it. Considering uh, both of us are probably musically did, challenged. <laughs> did, did you ever play a musical instrument? Yeah, um, someday I'll take you inside my house. I have a stand-up bass that I play. I'm not very good. I'm not very good. Um, actually, uh, where we live, we used to have big parties and we all get together and we play musical instruments and so on. And my wife would teach the woman girl down the road, um, Pam Dash on the guitar and we'd go down to her gram her grandmother's house and uh, have a big party and play the music. That we and I played the bass and fake it through, you know, I'm not very good but uh, my daughter was a little bit young then but it, w it was a lot of fun. We have a, there was a fellow down the road, his name is Mike Wright, he's 93 years old now. He got his nickname Mike from Noah John Rondo. He was born in Black Brook and knew him and his real name is Clarence and there's a person he, I would love to eventually interview. He's one of the nicest guys in, in the world and he also plays the fiddle and in 93 he still that's plays it, that fiddle that great. And, and he played, he was probably in his 70s then but he played the fiddle and my wife played the guitar. My brother when he used to come up uh, he he had a place down the road from where we lived, and then he moved to Pennsylvania with his wife. Uh, he play, he was a good guitar player, and so we, yeah, it was fun. That's great. Did you ever, with your with this wonderful love and passion for the out of doors, and the fact that you live pretty far back off the beaten path, have you ever thought about when you when you were younger? Have you ever thought, well, maybe I'd like to do the Noah John Rondo thing and. Yeah, build um, a little hut up there, and I don't know if that um, you wouldn't want to be that isolated. Yeah, I well, I you know, when one one of those summers up this Metagam, Ontario, when I was a teenager, I had no radio, I I didn't have a watch. The only way I could tell the time of the day was they run these trains that are called the Bud Car from Sudbury, <laughs> no B Bud two D's, yeah. two D's in the yeah. Bud, and and it was like a passenger thing. It was like a car that would take passengers and baggage. And it stopped everywhere. And we run from Sudbury out to uh, oh, um, White River, Ontario. And there would be run in the morning and one at night. The only time I could, way I could tell the time of day was because when the bud car came, I knew it was like 4.40 in the afternoon or something. I love it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> and you know, it never, it never bothered me uh, back then. And it was, I was up there like maybe 77 days on my own and did my own cooking, unfortunately, for that. Actually earned enough money to get a Coleman stove. I used to do it on a wood fire in the wood stove. Got enough money to get a Coleman stove, and um, that was heaven. And but no refrigeration or anything. It was mostly canned stuff. I still can't eat. Didn't eat more beef stew to this day. I ate so much of that stuff. Ah, uh, oh. you were lucky. No one did. John Rondo ate out of cans too, but they didn't have Denny Moore <laughs> back in his day. No, no. And uh, but to me, you know. It was a stage. I, I think I think I learned a lot from it. It was very made me very independent at that age. But um, nowadays, it's it's always the question of where do you draw the line between civilization and the wilderness? You know, I, I've mentioned it before in this program since we've been here. It's possible to, uh, at one time or another in your life, stay in all these worlds. You can have, as we say, at the, the best time. of all worlds at, at the, the same, same at time. At the same time. At the same time, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Particularly today, with all the gadgets and stuff. I did an article last Sunday on a, a thing called the Spot. Yeah. And um, it's a lot less expensive than a personal locator beacon, and it's certainly less expensive than a satellite phone. But you can. Uh, so if I'm in the middle of nowhere in Alaska, I can just punch in a thing, and it will go to my wife's email, or my daughter's text messaging thing, saying I'm okay. Do you know how many? This is. 
This is, I hope, is a, is a good compliment because when I read that, I had to run out. I couldn't wait to run out and tell my 10 best friends and family members about that. I said, did you see Dennis's, look at this thing. This <laughs> is truly amazing. And when you think of how many times people have, you know, when you almost fell off the side and down into the creek, yeah. think about what would happen if you, if you, uh, you know, pulled a hip out of the socket. Or something, or, yeah. Or, or right. something where you couldn't climb back I mean, I up and get back to your vehicle. I blacked out for a little bit, too. I mean, what happens if I had permanently or I had a concussion or something? Uh, I came back and went to, uh, my throat was bothering me and stuff. Because right? I got it, everything, I must have come down on this side because everything was on this side. I still got even a little red here from it, and that's eight, ten months away. But I went to Dr. Pichet in Plattsburgh who put a camera down and checked the, and, and I was basically okay. I was just banged up and I healed and stuff, but you're right. And you know, but then again, when I was younger, my view would be, if you're meant to die out here, you're going to rent to die. Where's a better place to go? Then? Where's a better place to go? It's better than in a hospital. Yeah. But but now, I don't know. Now that it's, you get older, you, think you don't about view it. it that way. Yeah, I mean, we've all heard these horror stories about these people who've been trapped and had to cut their fingers ah, or their arm or their foot off. Yeah. Or, and, it's you horrible. know, when you're in the... The old guys, they had to be used, used tremendous resources and whatever right. nature provided. But now... This device is called what again for the people who it's didn't called, see it's that article? It's called a spot. It costs about $149. You can buy it almost any of the uh, catalogs or just punch in spot. Uh, and it has three modes. It has the okay, so you can send it to your family saying I'm okay. Um, <laughs> the second one is help, but it's don't send the troops. Send you know help from the family. And the third one is 911. Where, and and that's a, the thing that worries me a little bit. If somebody does something incredibly stupid. And I mean, I did, but and I paid I the do price. Every day. But what I'm saying is, where they have to get a helicopter, yeah. where somebody cries wolf. We had yeah. that happen out over here in the US. We got oh, yeah, years sure. ago. Some guy got caught in the high water, and he had a personal locator beacon. Watertown sent out the uh, the military helicopter. They took him out. He goes back a year later to get his gear that he had to abandon there, and he gets trouble again. Well, the second time he called, they took him to the I don't know what county jail it was. Because that's an expensive price. I don't know how much a helicopter costs yeah. per hour. So you don't want to do it on, a, on just a, a whim. And also, uh, if you're back in there, you've got a certain amount of responsibility to use common sense and be careful, too. That was just, uh, I usually am very careful. But that time, things happen. You know, what can you There's say? There's no, you know. Yeah. That's right. Like the, like the bumper sticker, you know, oh, that says... It, things happen <laughs> right they really do and you don't know that's just but you've used uh, you know you don't go back in the woods with, a, with just a bowie knife and a piece of string no. you you have trail cameras you have uh, things that you use matter of fact you brought a trail camera out here can we take a look sure. at it uh, but I, I carry compass with me I, I have a little pouch that I carry with me and um, I have that and I have a camera I always have my little point and shoot camera because you always have to have a camera with you if you're my kind of, yeah. you know, yeah. vocation. And uh, you'd be surprised. All of a sudden, you get a quick look at an animal. you got the camera there. You snap off the pictures. Something that my big Nikon sits in there unless I go on a trip or something where I know I need a photo. They're having that little camera, and they sell them now. They're 10 megapixels, these yeah. cameras. 10 and 12 and, and, now. And, 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 and they got a nice zoom and lens in that, and they fit right into a pouch. I have a little black powder possible sack I carry on my belt. Oh, yeah. And it's really handy. And uh, because how many times have you said, finally had a camera? You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I, people, and they take their cell phones and take a, and take a cell phone picture, which is usually grainy because it's 1.7 right. megapixels instead of yep. 8, 10, 12. Yep. So this is what a trail camera looks like. Well, this is an old one. This is an old yep. one. I still like it, though. It's a, um, what it is, is basically a box <laughs> with a camera in it. And there's a solenoid in here. And the way it works is this. Like I said, now they're digital. I am not overly impressed by the digitals, but... Really? Well, I don't know. Maybe because I'm old-fashioned, you know. This is an old 35-millimeter um, uh, film camera. But what it is is the camera's hooked up to a solenoid here, and there's a beam of light, and guess what? We'll get a picture of Calvin over there. I can't just make Calvin make, move, Just make believe it's a, it's a panther. Um... <laughs> Calvin's waving now, and then so the camera's, Calvin is now part of my trophy collection, and so then when you go through the whole thing, <laughs> just don't draw and quarter him. 
I think the lens is what, yeah, okay. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> the, um, we do laugh at ourselves. And anyway, this, with this very, very, and this is probably 10 years old technology, I've gotten pictures of 50, 60 different species. No kidding. You have to stop it, Calvin. It's amazing. This day is so beautiful. I'm so pleased to be with, here with you, Dennis April, Great. for those people who might have just turned on their television set. You were talking about this trail camera. You said right. the technology's about 10 years old. Well, it's the, the principle is still relevant, but the uh, actual using film and so on is pretty much gone by the wayside. Everything's digital now, and they've gotten bigger cameras, like five, six megapixels. So the earlier ones were, the quality was not good. I like the snapshots, which turn out very well for newspaper work. And um, so anyway, you put this on, a beam of light goes out, an animal breaks the beam, sets off the camera, and then um, you run through the roll, whatever, you leave it out for days and days and days, and then I go and get it developed, and it's amazing. It's like kind of, what am I going to get this time? Yeah. And, and I talk to the, I, I know the women who uh, develop it, particularly when I go to Eckerd, and she'll go, well, Dennis, you got this, and I'm saying, oh, that's great, or you got this, and it turned out on clear, and so they know what it is, too. But this is a waterproof box, and it's attached to a tree. I don't have it here, but there's like a uh, bungee kind of thing there. Right. Oh, you that's head a good it to idea. A tree. And uh, I, I really, I enjoy it. You never know what you're going to find on your property. Do you change the levels up and oh, down? Yes. Just so One of the biggest mistakes people used to make, I don't know if they do it anymore because I've really publicized this, is for like a deer or something, they set it too high. They think a deer is like up here somewhere. When a deer is only about three feet high in its body, and you want to set it lower to get the picture correct. Um, I set it at all different levels. I'm, tr I'm trying right now to get every animal bigger than a mouse or a bat in the Adirondacks. And I'd like to do a book on it someday. That's a great idea. Wonderful idea. Adirondack wildlife through the eyes of a trail camera. And I, um, I think I've gotten the hardest species I think. I thought it was going to be an otter. I got an otter picture. I set it up um, at, like a trapper would at a beaver dam. I had it narrowed down. I had the camera here. I had otter lure I got from Paul Grimshaw up in uh, Coopersville, oh, sure. and and uh, I had some, uh, I think I used sardines or something. I put it out there, and it was right in the spring when the ice was breaking up, and so I got the otter. I've had bobcats, which I thought would be tough. I think now a martin may be tough, an American martin, because we don't have them really around here. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I've gotten just about mink? every... Mink? I've got a mink. I've got a mink. We get mink crossing around my, I have water around my house, and you see them uh, crossing Lots there. Lots of behind my yeah. place, too, yeah. Uh, muskrat I've gotten. Um, uh, well, yeah, well, that would be that would be cougar. an interesting. One. Calvin that hollered be... cougar from the peanut gallery over there. We've and yeah. Dennis who, and I who invited him about... to the conversation. Uh -huh. <laughs> but Cal, you and you and I have talked about that. Oh, yeah. it's, it's a controversy that'll rage forever. But you know something? If ever we're going to prove it or disprove it, it's now there's so many of these things out of there. Yeah. Lot, particularly hunters and that they have them out there, and, and uh, they found jaguar a couple of jaguars in Arizona, 150 miles from where they ever were thought to get to. And they did it by way of a trail camera in a desert, remote desert section. Hey, if there are people who believe in Sasquatch, there are bound to be people who believe in panthers. And, oh, yeah. And, and yeah, you got, yeah. I wonder how the uh, mountain lion or the jaguars got across U.S. security. Don't you love it? Yeah. Well, Calvin had one up his way there, uh, mountain lion. We did an article. I did a thing with uh, Channel 5. Yeah. Uh, border camera. We couldn't tell the size of the cat, though. I'm still not convinced. Because it, their security cameras are so far away to get it actually precise and find an object that you can measure the height with. But it certainly is an interesting It's titillating. It's titillating. There are a lot of things that live in the woods oh. that we, we, you know, we're discovering, rediscovering species we thought were extinct. Yeah. You know, the yeah. fish, the colacanth, I remember as a young kid when the Jap some <clears throat> Japanese fisherman found a, yep. a colacanth and it was thought to have been gone how many million years ago. Uh, so, you know. Ancient dinosaurs, yeah. yeah. Doing an article this Sunday uh, on a very ancient fish called the sturgeon. A uh, fellow I know from Plattsburgh caught one ice fishing up in, uh, <laughs> up, up in uh, the St. Lawrence River. And he, he unfortunately, well, for, it no, actually turned out okay. He took a cell phone picture. And I think we think it's going to be okay to run in the paper. It's a lake sturgeon. But, you know, they go back to the Mesozoic period. Of course. And they're very, very long-lived. 
and they get big. They get big, and, and I, I kind of throw in, because this will air probably after the Sunday, I put in a... a you can count on that. Yeah. <laughs> Calvin's got a lot of editing. <laughs> um, the, that maybe Champy was a big sturgeon, because they're mostly on the bottom. They come, maybe come up every now and then, and they're very primitive-looking fish. And you get a sturgeon maybe 10 feet long. Well, you know how people are. You ask somebody, well, how big was that bear? Well, it's 500 pounds. But if you look at a bear, it's really tough, unless you're really good, to be able to tell the weight of a bear. A moose, you, somebody sees a moose for the first time, oh my God, a thousand pound moose across the road. Well, maybe it was six or 700 pounds, you know? It's tough. The best way to associate it is to think in terms of, oh, that was the size of a golden retriever, or that bird was the size of a crow, something that, you know, you can actually get a point of reference. Related to, yeah. Because if you're driving along a highway, and let's just say there really was a mountain lion, and it came across at an instant. What would, you know what I'm saying? You're catching a glimpse of something. It's like the college professor who used to do the experiment with, um, with the witness thing. He'd have a student in a criminology class, he'd have a student outside come in and take an eraser and then go out again, and he'd ask this class to identify what the student looked like. Well, you get 20 different descriptions. Yep. So that's why I, I think with the mountain lion, it would be very interesting if we had some corroborating evidence like hair, a kill with you know, where you can get DNA or something. Because, um, boy, there's too many sightings to say that it's hoax. I don't, I don't believe but that. But the sturgeon, you know, it's so strange you should bring that up today. And I, I'm thrilled by these because I believe that everything is connected. All we have to do is get those dots connected. And that's, this interview is doing that. But I was interviewing somebody who's from Pennsylvania and her boss is from West Virginia. These are not people native to the North Country. And we're talking about coming to interview Dennis April, who does the outdoor piece, and they see that in the paper, and they that's one of their contacts with the North Country, and they feel at home if they've lived in the mountains of West Virginia or Tennessee, whatever. Huh. And so, of course, the conversation for me got around to Champy. And to talk about it, and I've interviewed in my radio career hundreds of people who claim to have seen Champy. And this woman said, yeah, but there's a great big fish that it's, it's really old, old fish. And it's looks, and she's trying to describe it. What's it called? And I said, sturgeon. Yeah, sturgeon, <laughs> that's what it is. And there you bring that back up today. Wow. Because the sturgeon, I'm sure, has often been confused with champy. But those surgeon, sturgeon, when I was a, a young kid growing up around the St. Lawrence River, were, I don't know how many sturgeon are left over there, do you? No, but they were threatened. They were threatened yeah, species. Yeah, but they were, they, were, they were more plentiful and huge back in those days. Yeah. But it's you're too, right about the way people view things. It's, uh, in, in, it's, a, it's a quick response. Even right now, if, if something came through here, you might think to yourself, well, it was that, but it really, really wasn't. That's why these trail cameras are kind of neat, because they record what, what they see. How many of you have you put up over the years? Trail cameras? Oh, my God. Lots of them. Sometimes you get things you don't want to see. For instance, in my neighborhood, things have changed uh, over the years. And so I'm getting more cats, domestic cats. Oh, no kidding. So people just kind of let the cats run. We never had that before. Coyotes? No, coyotes are, yeah, but they've always been here. And I have no problem with them because, I mean, a coyote, a coyote will uh, kill to survive. But you put a dog out, which unfortunately I'm getting those in the camera too. And a dog goes back and gets fed, is pampered, and goes out and just runs. And, and may not kill the deer, but it... it, just, it yeah, yeah. And, that's and, very sad. That bothers me a lot. Yeah. I've never got a person. <laughs> but, I, you know, that, and I, I hide them pretty good. But that would be kind of interesting, too. You know, it's uh, kind of like a security camera, too. But That's true, too. So you have put out quite a few. Yeah. And, and also, you get things that are... Just, I don't put it in the paper, disturbing. I got a picture of a fox carrying off a snowshoe rabbit. You know, killed it right there in front of the ah. camera. I've had a picture of, um, I did put it in the paper, a weird scene. Partridge coming into my woodlot, two of them, in a night, and an owl must have come down and t captured the one. And the other one's tail going flying right up like this. Well, that was the moment that the camera caught it. Isn't that bizarre? And so I put it in the paper as a mystery saying, well, what do you think, what happened to this partridge? 
and, <laughs> and I got all kinds of stuff back. Yeah. I'm almost convinced it was it was an owl. You know, it might have been like a kind of owl at night, but it was. Uh, re I have this. I have the picture here. Actually, I'll show it to you. Isn't that amazing? But, uh, and by the way, if you smell, it smells like there's been a skunk through here. That's the uh, otter. Here's here's the one. There's the one. Okay. We'll I don't, Calvin see that I don't later. know how much glare can, there is from here, he Calvin. But do that later. What do you think? Very, very interesting. Yes. You got it. He's got it fixed okay. on there. Uh, Isn't that here's what a, a shot? Now, sometimes you get these very candid. Now, here's a turkey vulture and a crow, probably landing or something. So. And these these are from the trail camera. Trail, this right from the trail camera. Here. Oh man, I love it. And uh, these are great. Is it that? That's a phoenix. Yeah, that's a phoenix rising from the ashes. I think I got wow, the wrong, look at this. Do I have the wrong photos? No. It doesn't matter. You, you can't have the wrong photos. Bear in mind that none of us have ever There's seen these. Wait a minute. We got to look at this. Oh, that's my otter, yeah. I got to see the otter. He's in midair, isn't he? Looks like his back feet are right off the water. Otter is tough because they travel widely and... Uh, that one was pretty lucky. I'm trying to think of what other animals can be difficult oh, to get. These are these are great. These and these are all mostly daytime shots, right? Do yeah. Uh, no, well, summer night, summer day. Um, Fisher. There was a time when I was getting tons of Fisher. Couldn't, Fascinating couldn't... animal, aren't oh, they? Oh yeah, yeah. Look at this. I'm glad I came to see you today for so many Turkey. reasons. Yeah, that's good. And, and know, as you true. said, they're they're so prolific this year. You know, I look Surprising. out at my Consider back the, door and I see 20, 30. Yeah. And and talk about turkeys and 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 they're roosting in the trees. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons why they make it too. See, a pheasant doesn't roost in the tree. But people don't realize that. Oh, I we, saw a turkey in the tree. No kidding. You want to see one fly? I mean, they're like one of those big old 747s <laughs> taking off. It's just that they're weird. And when they come down in the morning. They just kind of flutter down to the ground and they get in a row and they, they're, they're, they're an they're amazing incredible. animal to watch it all. This is too cool. That was right near your house somewhere. Yeah, right on a feeder. I, it was a, I had one set up because I was trying to get birds and I wound up getting a weasel. Who would ever guess that a weasel would go after suet? Yeah. Well, then I put a turkey on and went after that too. Isn't that amazing? You got it? This oh. one here, when I when I went to pick up the picture, the woman says, oh, you got a picture of a wild turkey. I said, look at no. it. I said, I don't think so. Oh, I don't think so either. So what is it? That's a turkey vulture. And you know the weirdest thing, I'm going to give you an unusual fact about those, is that they can eat roadkill that's 10 days old because they have some something in their system. They're one of the only animals that does as an immunity to botulism. You know, one of the most deadly poisons on the face of the earth, close to the embotulism. They'll find a skunk that has been run over 10 days, and you'll see him going at it, and well, they, they don't get seen sick. Him. How many times have we seen him on roadways, yeah? There's something that I'm worried about for the future is a, um, is a raccoons. There's too many of them. There's too many of them. Are they more and more? More yeah, in, in the rabies, there's always that threat. And yeah. One last one. Here's a coyote. I, it's not my best coyote one, but... Uh, Oh, that's a good. That's a good shot. No, that's a. Good I have shot. some that where they look like wolves. I don't know what ever happened to those coyotes. But um, it's fascinating. It's to me, it's like uh, prospecting a little bit. You don't know what you're going to get. I started with trail cameras. I should have brought it out. Well, it's okay. I made my first one when I was in my early twenties when we bought our place. And I made it out of an old Polaroid land camera with a popsicle stick like this and then the Dacron fishing line would come down it would be and, and I had a eyelet here set on a stool and set it over there and I put it out in front of my house we'd have a ham with a ham bone and I put it there and and the only problem was you could only get one picture with the Polaroid but you could get it developed instantly well I brought it back in and uh, we're very young and innocent and there's a picture of a huge black bear <laughs> About a hundred feet from the house, <laughs> grabbing the thing, and, and I got the Come picture. I got show, I'll show you the picture after the next break. And 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 uh, and and there it is. And it's looking at the camera. And what and, a great. And and I said, wow. Oh. I didn't realize we had. One.
that close. I'm going to be careful next time I set out that ham. <laughs> it's, it's, and, and, and with that, oh. and then I started getting really fancy. I'd set the uh, deck run line up so that the bear would have to come up and stand up to get yeah. her off the thing. And then one, sometimes you get the bear's rear end. Well, this was black and white because uh, that's what, but then, I, then they had color. Yeah, sixty-minute photos or something. Yeah. So I I did it in color and uh, but it was it was a lot of fun because but the thing was it was just it it was weird looking. I still use it in talks. I Talk show people like yeah, I had a roofing nail that would go down on top. I glue the roofing nail onto the popsicle stick so when the thing pulled down it would plunge off the thing. I'm, I'll be able to show it to you later. That's and and it would take interesting take and resourceful and Polaroid's going out of business. People are buying up the old cameras on eBay because yeah, they're going to start my... making stop making film this year. Well, so talk about the end of an era. You I have think... been around for a couple of years, Dennis. Oh yeah, well this is 70s. We're talking yeah. 70s, yeah. And and uh, it's uh, it, it's very very interesting and and I I, I love doing it. But um, I had it made into slides then and uh, Polaroid. I've had I, I have your you had to wait the yeah. 60, oh, 60 sure. seconds or whatever it was in that but uh, uh, yeah I, nowadays you talk about it. I give talks I gave a talk two years ago at Peru ninth grade class and I still use slides Why and I, I, I had a couple of ninth graders come up to me and say what is that not a clue <laughs> not a clue oh Looks my slides. god the, you know everything's PowerPoint of course. and 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 uh, I, I thought wow. Next thing you know, they're going to ask me, what about that camera? You know, is that uh, film? What's film? It's too that, bad. You're right. Yeah. What are records? What are records? Oh. You know. Although that's retro. IPod. That's coming, you know, a little bit back. I, I don't know. Maybe it is. But uh, what it's think about the, the eight tracks? What about the eight tracks? Eight tracks. I showed somebody an AM, FM portable radio, and they said, what's that slot in the side? Is that for a CD? <laughs> no. That's this thing goes in oh. there, and it's got eight tracks, and it plays. <laughs> What the heck? I was talking to uh, my college class about it. I had a, I teach an opinion and review, a journalism class. Oh, you do. And we're doing yeah, and we're doing sports now. I, oh, and I bring people great. to come in and talk. And this, uh, the editor of the Cardinal Point Sports came in, and he had done a column criticizing kids for being inactive and so on and so on for the video games and stuff. Yeah. And I happened to mention to the class, I said, I go back to the Pac-Man era, <laughs> Donkey Kong. And, and there's another guy in the class who's. Around the same era, and he goes, yeah, it is that. and they actually knew what it was. My students actually, the college students knew what they knew Pac-Man Pac -Man was. And I guess Pac-Man is almost a collector's item now, huh? Oh, of course, and I, I have the very first video game ever made. I got it at home in a box. It's called Pong. Pong. <laughs> little little ball would go around the black Something. and white screen that would burn right into your screen. Oh my God. And we we ruined. I don't know how many <laughs> portable television sets, and my kids thought that was the neatest thing, and I saved it. And guess what? It's probably worth ten bucks on eBay right now. Now nowadays, I mean, with the and, graphics and everything, it's uh, crazy. Which which brings us back to the outdoors. His point was that they're not getting, and maybe it's true. Maybe it's harder getting kids to go out and hunting and fishing numbers are down way down they are even but yet the non-consumptive stuff like hiking and that is holding pretty steady and I think it has to do a lot of it has to do with these video games and, and gadgets they're not getting out and doing physical exercise and hiking in the woods and stuff I mean it's not at all in all cases some of them climb and even when some of them who do it's competition you got to become a 46er how many peaks can you bag you know I'm not into that at all yeah I've climbed one I haven't climbed it. I drove up it. One hike. <laughs> Does that count? And I wrote a book here. Oh. I wrote a book on climbing mountains in the well, Let's Arundix. talk about books. You started write. You didn't write a book till 1999, right? Um, or 19? No, I actually, before that, I... Did you? The first book I actually co-authored was this one, Mammals of the Adirondacks. So that was uh, 1989. 89. Okay. I knew it was in that 89. era. This book here it was really my book. Let me book, hold that up so the camera, camera can capture it. A lot, of the, forever. A, a lot of the information is somewhat, you know, it, it needs to be updated. You That's can, why I would hope to do my do other that. book. Well, I'm not the... See, it's a long story on this book. But then my next one was Good Fishing in the Adirondacks. This was about the same time, around 1989, 1990. Okay. And um, I still think it's the only book that's honestly thorough about Adirondack fishing. Now, I've gotten books to review from a lawyer in New York City fly fishing in the Adirondacks, where he covers every stream, and, and I'm saying to myself, 
Who's, who humanly could do this? Yeah. Well, well DEC well, we stocking reports. We talked about reports. that a little bit earlier, weren't we? Weren't we? Right. I, what I did with this book is I did a chapter or two. I, I did the editing, but I got outdoor writers, guides, experts in each different zone to do chapters. And because I felt as though they know it is the best. And so there was no pretense that I was the expert on everything. Who knows Tug Hill? I mean, I, I wouldn't know where to begin. But I got somebody who knew of something about Tug Hill, a writer. To cover that chapter. So this one's still out. I would like to do a different cover. I actually photographed um, uh, a Fernet from, um, I can't think of it, Rob Fernet, I think it is, from Tupper Lake in a guide boat fishing, which would make a beautiful cover for this. This cover to me is just, I, it was one of the battles I lost with uh, Countryman Press. You don't win all the publisher battles, and I certainly have lost my share. And I felt as though this was too mundane a cover, and a cover so important for a book. Whereas with this book, this is my first real one. Oh, Good fishing in the, um, the past less traveled. It's a field guide to the low peaks of the Adirondacks. Great, great title, I love it. Was that your title? Yes, did? this whole book is mine. Photos, everything. That's you. And That's this, great. this is it's my daughter. This is my daughter on Silver Lake Mountain. Oh, and God. it was taken. What a picture. It's just absolute. Look at all the aspects of it. It's hard to drink it all in, isn't it? This picture was taken in the fall of 1997. You know, fall of 1997, okay? We're looking at Taylor Pond and Catamount, okay? And, a, and a, you can see, if you take pictures on a slightly rainy day, you don't get the saturated colors, you know, and it was, it was Columbus Day weekends. A year later, I, the Plattsburgh Mothers Club asked me to take them up on the same hike on Columbus Day. It was a year after the ice storm. You saw half the color. Catamount was pounded by the ice storm, 98. The color was not there at all. And I tried to tell those women, I said, you could not believe the difference one year made because that area was really hit hard, oh, my man. area and so on. By, uh, I don't live that far from Silver Lake Mountain. But, um, you know, wow. and, and that's, my daughter was 10 years old then, yeah, 10 years so, and then, uh, of course, we all look you, a lot younger. Are you, happy, are you happiest with this book? Uh, I'm very happy with it, yes. And how did you find Sherry to illustrate your book? I, I knew Sherry from, anyway. she used to work at the college, and um, she has books out. We've crossed paths, and uh, we've been friends ever since. Does she, she doesn't work at the college, does she no, now? No, no. Just to give you an idea. Yep. Now, did she collaborate with you on every one of the illustrations? I often wonder how that works with you. I told her, I said, I need a mountain lion. I need, <laughs> I need, I need a bear. Well, she had one uh, in stock. She'd use it. If she didn't, she'd draw one. Yeah. And, so, and she was a great person to sell the book, too. This is the last one I did. This was two years ago. Uh, this book is an interesting story. If, you, if, you can, if Calvin can get the front and back, I can tell you a story about that. I'll flip it over. We'll talk about the front. Tell me when you got it. Let's show them the back. Once again, it's just so absolutely beautiful out here today. Am I going to get rid of you we, guys today? No, or am I, gonna have I don't think dinner? so. I don't think so. I'm not hungry a bit because I'm drinking in whatever we got here. I may actually lose a pound just sitting at this table today. It's a beautiful day. And what, what is this date? The 25th of April, 2008. Guess what? It's four months ago Christmas. Here and we had snow at Christmas, and guess what? There's still some snow around There's here. Snow now. in the backyard. Okay, talk about it. Okay, this publisher here, this is very similar to this book. It's like unusual paths in that. The goal of this book was short hikes for somebody who's older or somebody who um, had kids that they could go on this trip, enjoy it, but also learn one thing. I want them to learn one new thing about the outdoors on, on each one of these. So we have a bog, like Silver Lake Bog. We have some other place like a waterfall or something well i felt as though i wanted the back to be the front cover i felt as though there's a spruce grouse there's my daughter hugging a very ancient white pine and there's my wife at a waterfall down by um, cascade lake yeah. in the uh, old forge area he the publisher insisted that he wanted this stuff and I said, well, everybody knows what a blue heron is, but spruce grouse. He said, well, who's going to see a spruce grouse? Well, I said, that's just the point. If they go to Spring Pond Bog, which is mentioned in this book, they may get a chance to see a spruce grouse. Herons are, you know, are herons. Yeah. This is the grandmother's tree. It's, it's 300 and something years old. It's nice, but it's a tree. There is a boardwalk. There is a cranberry. There is a trail. To me, 
this was much more interesting. But I lost that battle. Actually, he wasn't going to use this stuff. He was going to put my mugshot or something back there. I said, I don't want my mugshot back there. I don't want my picture. I want to use these other photos. So he went front and back with this. But once again, hikes, Farrow Lake Wilderness, Cooper Kill Pond, off the beaten path kind of things where, for instance, Cooper Kill Pond, there are moose over in that area. So I use that as one of the things, possibilities, you know. And Spring Pond Bog spruce grouse. If you go out there, you may not, you may hear one, you may not see one. They're very, very rare, but they're there. And just be, some people like just being around places where they are. Or you go to um, somewhere else. There's a geological, the Gulf, geological formation. Perfect example. We've talked about it often. I've written about it. What an amazing and special and unique place. Isn't right, it? exactly. So each one of these then, and both books, have something that I developed. We have like a, a section for notes so everybody can write their own experiences in and actually write their own kind of little guide to it too. And so they're uh, so this, called, is, this has notes. been out for a while, a couple two, of years. Two, two years, yeah. And this one's been out a while. This is in need of an update. What they did when we updated it the last time, and this is once again a publisher thing, and you can't, instead of putting a pull off label here, it's a beautiful photo, they put a thing embossed in the cover in white, new upgraded edition. It was nice to see it, but then again, it ruined the photo. But what can you do? <laughs> Everybody's got a different perspective on things. But I felt as though I was the one who, these are my books. Yeah. And they have to trust me to be able to, to do it. You right. May, you may never win that battle. Oh, you know. you'll never will. They're the ones it's who are a, paying for this it. This is a we we should let our viewers know who have never tried to write anything. Now, this is a tough business. I it mean, is. there are ways when you can, where you can self-publish it and get it exactly the way you right. want it if you want to shell out the cash, and then you get a you get a product that's less than perfect very often. And and uh, but but so the you've written four. Uh, four. Yes. Four so far. With any plans for? Well, I, I mentioned I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to do when I get all the photos with a picture the, with, with with an animal guide, but I'm not going to do it as like habits, food preferences, breeding season. You know, like the field guide. Yeah. I want to do it with anecdotes of like, okay, moose. Go through the natural history a little bit, and like the articles I do, and then get into like stories a little bit about okay. them, and 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 then have a couple color photos of moose. There's but there's always depends on if you publish or not. Notice this book here, the way the way in which it was set up. You have to run your color in one section. Yeah. Because if you intersperse color, it costs a lot of money. Although with China printing now, a lot of the printing going on in China, it's really cut the cost of books. So in this book here, we had to go black and white to do it on the same page. Ah, uh, yeah. And same thing with uh, this this one right here. It's the same thing. So you have to you have to go black and white. Color would be very very expensive. If I was doing it myself and I had the money, unlimited funds, I would love to do. Color. Well, your your um, your book has never been done. This kind of book with the, with the animals in the Adirondacks has never been done, not extensively, right? Well, this one here, and I mean, there's been some overtures to doing these kind of things. Thing is, I this was my book idea, and somewhere along the way, it was a difficult time, and um, I wasn't out of Utica. This is published out of Utica, and this guy Almost was local. Every book. Yes, I didn't try to avoid the names. And, and so anyway, he just kind of stepped in, and although I wrote most of the text, and then with the photos, he had to contract out anyway. I asked her for a budget to, to get the color photos. It turned out they did it anyway. They didn't use that hardly any, you know. So I would like to use my own photos and uh, get into the natural history. But I, 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 what I tried to do with these hiking guides is I didn't want them to be like, I think the Adirondack Mountain Club does an excellent job. But it's like, it's two tenths of a mile you come to a lean to. The trail on the right, blah, 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 winds up here and so on. I try to put in little stories and anecdotes and personalize it a little bit. You know, something happens. Something just to get it away from it. You need a niche. And this is the 28, 28 is it? How many? 20, it started out was 23. The first, this edition is 23, which is half of the 46. I did oh, it on purpose. Then we, of course, had to expand it to more. I was actually thinking about having a low peak club, you know, like the uh, 23ers. 
Oh, half the 40 figures. But, uh, uh, you could do it too, you know. Uh, it's a lot of work though. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Calvin so certain, wants to sign up. I see him. He's, he's ready a to novel go. idea, <laughs> yeah. And they're easy climbs, I mean. Ugh. How about Adirondack Knolls? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but, you know, not everybody is a super athlete. I, um, Dr. Dittmar, who was for many, many Did, years. Dittmar, a, Dittmar yeah, dear, a great, dear absolutely, absolutely dear tremendous friend. person. I his pictures in this book because I knew him from over at Silver Lake and so on. He couldn't, when he got older, here's a guy who climbed the High, highest 46 with and, jogging and mary had climbed climbed him twice exactly. before she ever met him he uh so he, but he couldn't do it but he could do these little ones yeah silver lake mountain and stuff like that so to me that and and with kids when my kids were young i'd get my daughter <laughs> we'd be climbing like a, a one mile climb mountain panther mountain we get up about 200 feet my daughter would go are we almost there yeah <laughs> been there done that yeah and 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 I, I say and then when we almost get to the top she says are we almost there? And I said, no, we got about half a mile to go. <laughs> oh, my God. Great. I'm so glad you mentioned Dit Dittmar, because I mentioned Noah John Rondo, and it just happens that Dit Dittmar and Noah John Rondo were dear friends. Oh, I didn't know that. And we, oh, we were doing our last interview with, uh, with Dit Dittmar. Um, he dragged out a tape recording that he had done of Noah John Rondo in an interview right in his living Dit's living room in Silver Lake. Wow. And we ran it on the end of the TV show and you wouldn't believe the comment that it generated because it's Noah John Rondo. People have read about it and they've never heard his voice unless they go to the Adirondack Museum in Blue Mountain Lake and hear a recording next to his hut. Uh, and they would hear him telling these anecdotes because he was a storyteller. And you know that's the, that's the meat of well, what we're doing here now but also in writing. And I try to get my college students to understand that. Boy, it's one thing to have the boring but important information, but it's nice to have an anecdote where it just kind of yeah. makes everything just fit together. Yeah. Get... And it kind of breaks the flow in that, and, and, and that's great. Now, granted, there are anecdote talkers who could write a book in one sitting with their stories. I guess Rondo was one of those. Uh, but if, but if, they're, if you pick and choose them, they're really, really... Yeah. Interesting. We have a few very good Adirondack storytellers. Some are not with us anymore, but some are. And I know tell... there's a fellow named Smith, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, the best. Yeah. And, and then, then there are some people who do it in song, which is, to me, even more fascinating. And some do both, tell stories and play the guitar. Christopher Shaw, I think. Yeah, oh, yeah. the best. Roy Hurd, I think, what a guy. Too, to and, some extent. And Roy. Poncho. Poncho, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's you know, it's a fascinating area. That's the one thing I found different when uh, between the Adirondacks and Tennessee. I have a in my house. I have a my senior year of college. My parents wanted me to get a college ring. I don't I don't wear rings. I can't I can't wear a wedding, wedding ring. I can't wear anything. I barely can wear a watch. And then my my other relatives wanted me to get a college ring. So I told them, okay, I'll get one. So they sent me, I got two sets of money for the college ring. One, I bought an Appalachian dulcimer from Gatlingburg. Ooh. This was before it was handmade. It was before it was before. I love it down that, there. And, 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 um, but they had that tradition of music down south there in the mountains. Yeah. That we, they, we didn't really have that kind of thing, that southern Appalachian music kind of thing with the dulcimers. Yeah. And, and um, I'm trying to remember what else. But, uh, and it was really easy to play. It's good because I'm not overly musically talented in a dulcimer. Just about anybody can play. So uh, that was, I, I forget how much I paid for it, I hate to say, but maybe $50, yeah. $60. Yeah. And uh, that was, you know, now things have all changed. Gatlingburg has really become. Gatlingburg and, and uh, nearby Pigeon Forge. Uh, commercial. Dolly a, Land and there's all a that. Show, there's a show on every street corner. Oh, my corner. God. But the Smokies are beautiful, But the Smokies too. are right nearby, and there's, you know, there are pl special places where you can hike and one thing I didn't like about them was the snakes. I'm not into poisonous snakes at all. Uh, me either. And so, so I require I'd somebody go into to the, say, I'd don't go, touch that one. I'd go into the Smokies, except for fishing. I'd go in there in October, November, after the snakes were away. But uh, here, that's the one thing we don't have. I don't think in most of the Adirondacks, we don't have a uh, poison. We just have the little timber very, rattlers over by Lake George. Very but, few. Yeah. You know, I wanted to mention cameras because you have the old and the new. And this is your Pentax. They, how long have you had this? Uh, it, it seems like an eternity because today in technology, 
but it's probably only about two or three years old. Hundreds of pictures. See how small it is. Yeah. And then look at a brand new one that you got very recently. This is the Olympus that we talked about before. Hyper Crystal LCD. It's the Stylus well, 1010. I don't, you know, believe it or not, I, I still have a hard time with those things in the sun. I'd rather have what Calvin's using, one of those things where you look yeah. through. Because to me, well, there's no battery in there. But, no, I know. Yeah. I'm just having him look at the size of it. It's almost the same size, a little bit thinner. But they are difficult. I, I, I'm of the viewfinder age myself. Yeah, yeah. And my first digital cameras had a viewfinder. So if I didn't want to look at mine the screen too. or because mine were washed out, I would lift it up here and my wife would say, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to look yeah. through the viewfinder. No, and, and I know exactly what you're saying. But and, the and technology is super fantastic. You'll be delighted with this picture. Well, this one here, and this is waterproof, and it can actually, I know, I went on a trip last summer up to British Columbia. I did the Alaska Highway with a woman from uh, Northern British Columbia Tourism. She had one, and she was really extremely athletic. She would go underwater and take pictures of salmon with this camera because it's good to, like, eight feet underwater. But I like it because it fits right into my belt pouch. So if yeah. I'm walking, this is what I carry with me. But this is a good example for people who want to start hiking and people who emulate what you do on a smaller scale. You've always, you've you always got to have, out. you really always want to have a camera handy. It's, you know, I've had people say to me, oh, I saw this bobcat. I only wish I had a camera. Yeah. What yeah. I do is I just make sure I have one. And um, the biggest problem for me sometimes is I let it sit for a while, particularly in the winter, the battery goes dead. And there you had a great picture and nothing. But um, it happens to all of us. And I always have my pad inside my pouch. This is my little possible sack. Because unlike you, Gordy, who's a, you know, microphone or what, uh, a recorder person, I just, I jot down ideas for my columns. I jot it down, I, whatever I'm thinking of, it gets it off your mind. It's kind of a catharsis too. And when you're walking, it's such an enjoyable experience in the woods that I may say to myself, I got to remember to bring this back. Because in, in my uh, wood lot, I have... Um, I have a kind of a hunting camp set up there about maybe three quarters of a mile back in. And I'll think, well, maybe I need a pail or something. And But I've got so many things. You know, like today, we have so many things going on in our minds. I jot it down. I've tried the tape recorders, and it just... I say, don't misunderstand me. I take notes, too. I take more notes than anybody you ever saw in your life. Then I go back because I'll write it very fast. And I'll say, what in the devil was that word with three funny little letters in it? And if I don't, if I don't transcribe the notes or do the action that I've asked myself to do in those notes within a couple of days, it's lost forever. But with the but books, with, with these books here, these two, these two books here, I did use a tape recorder because I would say I would do the car mileage. Okay, I'm at miles because you gotta. The one thing that's very, very important about a guidebook is you have gotta have exact directions. Yeah. If you screw something up, even though it's self-evident, somebody is gonna screw it up, and I and I, I can tell you an example of that. Um, I gave a talk at the Farm and Family Center years and years ago, and they had my books there. And I had a woman come up afterwards, and she goes, there's no way that mountain is where you said it was, that trail, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, what mountain are we talking about? And she gave, gave me the name, and I said, well, it's not in my book. But that just goes to show you, wherever that person read about it, they don't forget the wrong directions. So if it's two-tenths of a mile to the stop sign from the north way, and you make a right, you better have a two-tenths of a mile. Because even if the stop sign is there at three-tenths of a mile, Surely something's going to foul it up. It's, isn't it amazing how the old-time writers, and I'm sure you've read all the books that the old-timers wrote about the Adirondacks and the guides and so on, what they used for, uh, instead of saying two-tenths two of a mile from the stop sign, they'd use a certain rock or, or Joe Blow's, I like that. Joe Blow's Brick House or a tall pine paces. tree, a hundred paces. A hundred paces. The deer was a hundred paces in front of me. I like that, though. I, I, you it's know, so I, charming, I, isn't it? I, I, everything is just, I, but you know, when it comes to directions, now, granted, when I do the hikes, I don't tell them two tenths of a mile. I'll say, well, about a third of the way up, you come to a rock outcropping, <laughs> something like that. Uh, and, and I do, I, I could check it with, I have a wrist GPS unit, or I could check the distances, but um, I, I don't think but people buy my book for that. They're not looking for buried treasure, they're looking no. for natural treasures. Natural treasure, and, and, and that's the thing, discovering something new. Well, that's why day. I like the idea, this whole trail camera idea. I think you've opened a lot of eyes that way. And I've talked to quite a few people who never, not even serious photographers or outdoors people, who just 
think that is such a neat idea to put a camera on a tree and capture something yeah. going by. And then, like you said, surprise. That's the, the Polaroid was great because, um, and I mean, that if you would have seen what it looked like <laughs> set up, it was an old stool, like I said, and, and that Dacron line, and you can actually see when the picture was taken. Not there's the, there's were... the Dacron line. Isn't that... But you want to know something? I gave a talk down at the Adirondack Mountain Club here in Plattsburgh on trail cameras and showed him that. And a woman said to me, you know, you're about 90 years too late, and sh 70 years too late. There was a guy named Shearus, George Shearus. He's a famous biologist. They named a moose subspecies after him. And he was taking pictures with the old, you know, the thing with spark and then take yeah. a picture in 1900 up in Michigan of deer trail cameras. They'd set it off. He'd have them trip over the thing and that. Uh, so that just amazing? when you think that you are the most clever, creative person, that's why I say you can't take yourself too seriously as far as your own, your own worth because somebody may have done it before. <laughs> How to be deflated in one easy lesson. Well, I've read articles yeah. here recently. A guy in the Press Republican, back, I'm not going to mention where or whatever, did this article on moose. Now, if there's one topic I know a lot about is moose. I've studied them. I've done field work and so on, researched them. And I'm looking at this stuff, and I'm saying, this stuff is stuff that's been heard for 20, 25 years. And it's the way the person's presenting it. This is unique information. But yet it's never given any sight. Where did you get it from? You know? And I think that's maybe one of the banes of uh, general outdoor writing today is that, you know, I try to give credit. Like this Sturgeon article, I got a lot of the information. A lot of it's general, but I still got it from DEC, from their website. you got to attribute it. You can't just come out there like you're the know-it-all doing this. I get emails, incredible amount of emails. Is this legal? Is that legal? What is this? What is that? I got one just two days ago. Are you allowed to use two flies to troll? Or is it only in a no-kill area, blah, blah, blah. So I didn't know the answer, so I sent over to DEC. They emailed me back. I called the guy back. But I made him sure that he understood it wasn't me. Yeah. It was DEC because I don't know everything about everything. Some of them are hilarious. Back in the old days, I get a call from um, a woman saying, boy, you ought to hear down the road there, there's the weirdest screaming. I can't describe it, but it's really weird screaming. And I, I felt like saying, have you checked on your neighbors lately? <laughs> <laughs> was there a full moon last night? How do you know? How can you possibly tell? I mean, it could be a cat with a fox face to face. It could be so many things. But I feel obligated. I feel very, very obligated. I try to do answer every email and answer every phone call I can because I feel as I owe it to my readers. You know, it's a, it's. A, I don't know if you can, if either one of us can adequately explain the obligation that you feel to respond to people who are kind enough to read your stuff right. and ask you a question, and you turn over every stone to try to get the answer for that person. And yet there's another, there's another feeling of people who, who write and, and do these things who never respond to emails. Right. But we live in an area where you can't fool everybody all the time, no, nor I mean, do I even try. And, and there's a more of a, a, I used to write for the Albany Times Union. I did, some of these actual hikes were from the Albany Times Union. I had no clues to who my audience was. Yeah. I, I did some outdoor outdoor page stuff for them, and somebody said, well, I saw your article on what deer smell in a sporting goods store in Colony. Now, I have no idea. You know what yeah. I'm saying? I do write for the Montreal Gazette, too. I do travel stuff for them. I have no clue as to who, who's reading it. But here, you do because you're more part of the community. I'd rather, I, I, I wouldn't run away right for the New York Times. I mean, it sounds like very no impressive. I. I, I, I could care less. No. I mean, there, you know, you throw out names and stuff, but, but you don't get the same sense. And I live so far out that I, if my articles appear, I don't see Three minutes. anybody. Yeah. That's great though, <laughs> when you get feedback. You yeah. get instant, and, yeah, and it's instant feedback. We, we're unique in many ways here in the North Country. One thing they'll let you know whether they love you or hate you, or or any innuendo and, and, or any but, nuance but people, in between. Generally, people are very kind. Yeah. I mean, unless you really, really tick them off. And we deal with topics that are really not, you know, I know I've done some deer baiting ones. I mean, it is a problem in the North Country, and um, you know, I don't know if they, I I always do the orange one. I really believe the hunter should wear orange. I think it should, but but you know. Yeah, go ahead. You <laughs> Keep can, going. He's telling me that we have three minutes left. Three minutes. Okay. You, you don't have to panic, Dennis. Okay. Well, hey. But anyway, minutes. the yeah, the orange. I agree with you. And and but you know, I do it. I've tried it. 
using the uh, statistical approach. I tried doing the emotional approach. Do you really want your, if you accidentally shoot somebody, do you want your picture in the paper? You know, you want your neighbors knowing about it? Do you want to risk going to jail? Blah, blah, blah. I still can, there's some people who just will not wear it. Yeah. And and so I understand that, but I feel the obligation that every fall before deer season, I'm going to do that article. To talk to Even them, if yeah. one or two people change their minds and so on. It's like the inmate up in Dannemora. Maybe it's a good way to close it up. I had a guy in all the writing classes. It turned out he blew somebody's head off in Brooklyn. He had the place robbed, and he had his gun on the guy's head, and he blew his head off. And I said, why in the hell did you do it if you got the place robbed? He said, I don't know. He says, I'm from the city, blah, blah, blah. We didn't even give it a thought. If we teach them enough logic, even though they may never get a job in the outside, to think twice about doing something like that, if they just hesitate for a second, maybe we've done something more than getting them all the jobs in the world. Well, you know what? I, I told you when we started, and I've told you many times <laughs> in the past, that we, uh, I really appreciate what you do and what you've done and what your plans are in the future. And I, I appreciate the fact that you have impacted thousands upon thousands of lives, not because you actually feel consciously every day I want to leave my mark, but because you care about the outdoors and you want other people to share your passion and to take their little three-year-old, four-year-old girls out for a walk in the woods or their sons and daughters or grandchildren. And that, at the end of the day, to me, and I'm sure to you, that's what makes the whole thing worth Well, I appreciate you asking me on, and I got to keep watching my back, though, because every time I get to 1,000, Gordy's going to be get sick number 600. I got to keep moving. <laughs> Neither one of us are going to catch Cal Ripken. No. That's for sure, but... Uh, Cal Ripken over all those... Cal Ripken Jr., we should say, Jr. is the guy that... <laughs> That I uh, used to know the exact number. Calvin, come on up with it. Two thousand seven hundred and uh, it doesn't matter. We're not going to look long <laughs> Who knows? Somebody but, knows that and will tell. But I know when my time comes and I'm out of there. Gordy's going to be right there. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that's good. Hey, Gordy, you thank know you what? very much. It's this a is a great pleasure. I'm going to look at a lot of your pictures, and I'm going to tell everybody I know about this upcoming book. I hope it's within the. Oh, the span of my lifetime. They border, the borders carries these. No, these I books. mean the new book with oh, the all the book. thousands and thousands of I'm, pictures. I think of when I get the, life. I'm trying to just get the time, and you know, I may have to fudge a little bit, get somebody else's uh, photos on a couple of things. Martin, in particular, DEC has yeah. them because they're doing a study in that, and uh, and and I think it'd be fun to do. And, uh, I think it'll be wonderful. Okay, and then I'm, I, maybe I can you, come back on again. You, you're going to put our friend Nathan <laughs> Farb in the shade. I don't think so. I you don't, don't think there's any danger. <laughs> I don't think there's any danger. Thanks with that. a lot, Dennis. Thanks it's again, been Gordy. Wonderful. Yeah. We've enjoyed seeing the ponds. Calvin, walking. And some days we'll take a walk in the woods and just see how far we can go before we drop. And you say goodbye, I'm, hey, fellas. Gordy, the one thing I'm not going to do, I'm not carrying Calvin out. <laughs> there ain't no way. <laughs> we try to carry each other, and I'm sure we fail in every respect. Thanks again, Dennis. Thank you all for watching. If you want to support this program, we'd love to have you. You know how to make a contribution to Hometown Cable, to Calvin Castine. Let us know how you feel. Give us an opinion about what you'd like to have us do next. And who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner. <laughs>